Okay, we are back here live in uh, Silicon Valley. This is a special presentation with theCUBE, Silicon Angle Media, Wikibon on theCUBE, presenting uh, Big Data SV. The theme is Follow the Money. And our, our next panel mm. is with the people who write the big fat checks, the venture capitalists, and we stalk them, follow these guys, we'll just follow, I'll find out all the action. So I am super excited to have with me Ping Lee, who's a general partner at Excel Partners, um, friend of the Cube, has been on the Cube many times, and is uh, uh, on the Midas list uh, of Midas Touch inv investors, also an investor in Cloudera and a variety of big data companies, and, and we've been following uh, Ping's career and certainly the big data investments with Excel over the years, and it's been fantastic to watch, and certainly uh, got a great perspective from Ping. Um, Frank Artali is managing director at Ignition Partners, former executive at Microsoft, you're familiar with NT, you all know what that is. Frank was a big leader in that initiative and has a lot of great his history. Also an investor in Cloudera as well as a variety of other investments. So guys, welcome to the panel. So uh, uh, follow the money, that's the theme. Um, a lot of money's being spent, it was, came up earlier on Twitter. Where's all that money going and why, why isn't there more billion dollar companies in big data? Uh, where's all the apps? Where's all the exits? And certainly, Ping, you've had great success with Cloudera. Uh, as an investment, um, what's going on with big data? Hit, hits, misses over the past five years. What's your view on it? Are you happy with it? The progress, obviously, Cloudera is a success in standpoint, but other investments in general. How would you grade the ecosystem in general? Well, I think the, the my first observation is I, I think it's still very early, uh, despite all the activity and uh, conversations around big data. I think this is a this is a technology cycle trend that's going to last. May, much more than five years, 10, 15 years, right? If you look at the relational database market, how long that took to kind of ecosystem to get built and get formed, I mean, that's, we're, we're talking decades. Now, I think technology cycles happen faster now than they did in the past, but I still think we're in the first, second, or third innings of kind of this big data build out. And if I look backwards, I think a lot of the innovation has been around the, the data management platforms, the, the, the Hadoops, the, the Sparks, and all the underlying technologies that I think will drive a lot of the, the next generation platforms for applications to get built on. And frankly, I think if you look forward, uh, the application ecosystem on these new platforms is still very early, it's still very nascent, right? Whether it's BI tools, ERP tools, CRM tools, all these different applications that we have used over the last decades to make our lives be better as a business user productivity, I think they're all going to get replatformed and, and leverage a lot of these new uh, uh, big data technologies, whether it's a Duper Spark or whatever, uh, in order to deliver better experiences for, for users. And so that's re, just get going. So replatforming has been a theme we've heard. Um, so the question for you then is, what were the hits and misses? I mean, back then, I mean, first of all, it was Wild West back then, and Hadoop in 2010, 2011 was like, no, no one even knew what that was. So you made a good bet in, on your thesis with, say, Cloudera, but what were the hits and what were the misses, if you'd look back? And then let's, and talk about a little bit more about that re replatforming, where that is now. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think it's, uh, it's early to predict hits or misses, you know, that's in, in our business. You never, you never predict these things until they actually happen, then you, t then you seem really they're smart. They're still swinging right yeah, now. Exactly. They're not, so, they're yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's really early. Yeah. I mean, there'll be some long deaths. There's, <laughs> there's going to be long deaths. Uh, you know, look, I think yeah. there, early on there were 50 different types of NoSQL databases. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's definitely uh, a much smaller list right now with Couchbase and a few other ones that have, you know, seem to have, um, you know, getting a lot of traction. So I think that, that in of itself has, has consolidated. Um, early on, there were a lot of different ways to do, um, you know, batch processing, and I think you know Hadoop kind of, you know, became the one that you know embraced a lot of it. There were 15 different file systems, so I think I think a lot of things have, have consolidated, you know, at that layer. Um, I think the things that you know at the application layer, a lot of them have gotten off to slower starts just because it took a while for the underlying technologies to take hold. So, uh, you know, we're looking forward to seeing how some of those evolve, whether it's some of the BI players. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah, I'll just add to this too, is that in terms of, you know, what we, what we, many people think about these things as being databases, like in, in the, especially in the situation of, of the Hadoop, uh, the Hadoop, let's just say stack. I mean, what people should really understand, it's more, it's more of like an operating system for data than just simply a store. Yes, it, yes, it does storage, but it does an awful lot of processing. So the, it just takes a little bit of time for people to make the transition from their thinking around the relational world to what we're in right now. And this is not like, the time back in say the early 1990s where we made the transition and you know, folks like us were around back then, we made the transition from mid-range and uh, mainframe systems to, to distribute it. By and large, back then it was really just getting the same type of tech, if you will, deployed on smaller systems and deployed. What we're dealing with right now is really a completely different enabler. 
So for someone who is working on IMS on a mainframe system to work on an index file system on, a, uh, you know, on Unix, it wasn't as much of a leap as someone going from, say, something like SQL Server today to using something like, something like Cloudera. And so you know, to echo Ping's statements here, it's, you know, we're, we're in early days, and to say that there's you know, been swings and misses, there's certainly been a lot of swings, but, you know, but the misses are still, I think those, those stories are still to be played out. Um, but if, if the history repeats itself, we do have consolidation. We had you know, tens of databases you know, back, in the, you know, back in the 90s, and then you end up with about three, right? And so you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but you know, we're pretty confident that it is early days, and it's, this is a, let's just say, uh, an area that, uh, that we look forward to more on the enabling side. We don't want to hear about problems. There aren't problems here. These are about creating businesses which couldn't exist otherwise. So let's talk about the platforms for a second, because I think the replatforming brings up your point about the old days. And the old days, platforms were land grabs. Microsoft, where you worked, had a great platform. They had an operating system and application monopoly, or uh, a competitive advantage, I should say. Um, so with now, with, with Cloudera, for instance, when I talked to Amar Awadala, when you first did the investment guys, he was a scale-out guy from Yahoo, who basically said scale-out's the future on commodity hardware. Yet all the big whales, as Jeff Kelly talks about our scale up guys. So, so I want you to talk about this, this, this notion of what horizontally scalable cloud and scaling up coming together in that platform. Is it ownable? Is it an opportunity? Uh, is open source change again? What's your sure. take on that? Yeah, so, so just like you know, to, uh, you know, to, you know, to look at again how things are, you know, we never like to say it's different this time, but, uh, but the enablers here, right, the thing that's something like Hadoop as an example that we're using, or things like elastic, you know, el elastic databases like this, elastic processing enable, is that you can think about a, a customer or, or an organization or a scientist or anyone can think about having an application that can need, at a given point in time, tens of thousands of nodes of processing. Now, if you're saying you're a scale-out person, you have to go allocate all of that up front. Even if you say, well, I'm going to use cloud resources, you know, it's really hard to go kind of string that stuff together. And so when, when Amr talks about using scale out and, and elastic and commodity parts, he's, uh, he's saying that this kind of technology enables applications that just couldn't be thought of in a scale, in a scale up world, because you have to plan, of all, plan for all of that CapEx up front. Now with the availability of cheap, cheap cores, either on something like, like Amazon AWS or Microsoft Azure, you can just go after those cores at the, uh, at, the time you, at the time you need them. And so it really frees up the people's minds in terms of uh, the kind of applications can be built. So I mean, now there are times where maybe a scale up thing would, will have, you know, have cert certain advantages in sort, of, in sort of the old world where you had you know, in, um, certain types of query processing that required memory locality. And those are, you know, but those are things that came, were different. They came out, of, came out of the relational world with certain types of SQL calculus, which, which let's just say don't apply. Uh, in these, uh, for these newer, for these different types of applications. I, I think, don't underestimate Moore's law. I mean, I think what Intel continues to do um, in the data center has provided, you know, over the last decade has created a whole new ecosystem of building software applications and software platforms, right? And I think that's, and we're just harnessing, the software's just harnessing all that innovation and translating that to the applications now, right? So I, I think, you know, if I look at our portfolio and the type of applications we're building, they're assuming, you know, really, really powerful, efficient commodity hardware that can scale out and they're looking for software platforms. And they're not really databases anymore, they're data yeah. management platforms that can, that can harness the value of this, in, you know, at, at scale, right? So I think that's, that's the innovation that's already, that's already happened, right? So now the question is how do you package all that hardware and software and deliver that into an application for an end user, a business person, actually get value out of it. So how do, what are you guys investing in, in, in terms of when someone walks in the door, we were talking on theCUBE today with an entrepreneur, he said, ML is the new SQL, machine learning is the new SQL. Uh, things like that are happening, you got Internet of Things happening, and you're talking about in memory with Sparks, uh, recent success, in silicon and analytics, you know, insight engines, all this stuff's happening. It is an operating system that's going on on the internet called cloud or whatever you want to talk about it, but as investors, how do you make sense of it? What are you investing in? What, what's going to get your attention uh, and from the money-making standpoint, beyond like the small, you know, that could be a double or single, what's the home run uh, pitch that you're looking at? Yeah, so I'll start. So like, so for, uh, again, this doesn't apply necessarily to, to big data. I mean, just in, in general, if you can pick a point in time, anytime what, what folks like us do, you know, we, we try to look at things that are applicable to, let's just say, all businesses or businesses of all sizes. And, uh, and so, if you look at, you know, so we use history as a guide, right? And it doesn't always necessarily repeat itself, but it sometimes does, you know, does rhyme. Uh, and you find all of the things that, you're, um, that might have happened in the past and you attempt to make, we attempt to look at things where we can make a bet 
uh, on things to sort of mimic things that happened in the past. And so if you looked at things that happened, let's just say around the database, although we're not a database in this context, we're more like a complete data management or, or operating system for data, what are all the things that happened in, say, in when client server took hold? Well, you had productivity tools that suddenly hooked up to databases, right? And that freed up, that freed up the data from someone requiring uh, like a software developer to go write a program. So we like things that kind of like free, free up that data. Then there are types of, of productivity applications that are enabled because of the availability of data. And so as people start living in data, and we like to look at those things. But in, in our minds, we always ask ourselves, is this, is this a thing, like a class of thing, that, a, that any company would say more than 1,000 employees would be, would be likely to, you know, to purchase one of or need? And that may be something that affects the end user or something that makes the infrastructure protected or secure, something that makes the IT professional's life easier. They're not going away. So that's sort of how, how, we, look, how we look at things or how I, I look at things. I know, you know Ping and I talk about these things all, you know, all the time as well. We're much, uh, you know, again, using history as a guide is, you know, I think in the, in the venture world, people say pattern matching uh, is, is something that we do. Your, your home run pitch? Well, Fastball, you know, curveball, what, what are you looking for for ideas? And I, I, I have to be, um, Ken, I, I think right now pretty much every part of the enterprise stack is, is available to, for disruption to build a massive company. Um, we are dealing with changes in the last couple of years that I think are incredibly profound, right? Starting from you know, the scale out stuff we're talking about where hardware and compute now is kind of pervasive and elastic, right? We're talking about you know, cloud-based software that can take advantage of that. We're talking about mobile platforms that didn't exist before. We're talking about operating systems. And we're talking about containers. I mean, there's a complete rejuvenation of the data it's center. Foaming at the mouth, ready to write checks. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge I, opportunity, no, you're I, you know, I, you know, I think there's, there's, there's constant talks about you know, the bubble and the tech. And you know, my view is that there's going to be some amazing companies, large companies get created. These are, such, these are fundamental shifts that are not going back, and they're very horizontal and how they impact people. So you're saying there's waves coming. There's yeah, a lot of waves coming. Yeah. This is one wave now. So, so let's go into that. So I got to ask you, so I was there when you announced the $100 million big data fund, and the thesis there was, oh, it's going to be a lot of apps. I think that was like three years ago. Uh, I also had a chat with uh, Pat Gelsinger right before Paul Moritz went to uh, Pivotal, uh, when before they spun that out, and they had this big vision, mainframe in the cloud. It just never happened because there was other things that needed to get fixed, which kind of stalled the plan. So I don't think the thesis was incorrect, but I want to get your perspective on the timing, right? I mean, uh, your, the apps are coming, you mentioned that. So mm -hmm. what, what's your take now? I mean, obviously network virtualization, VMware's working on that, Pivotal's having their success. Um, is it the same trajectory? Is apps still going to be the big thing as people realize they have all this data and they're data full and they're, they have to solve their own problems? I mean, is that what you're looking for? What's your take on, on that trajectory of the apps? I think data-driven applications uh, are just starting to emerge, and applications take time uh, to build, but you know, one of the companies that you know, we were able to work with last year, uh, Relate IQ, that ultimately got by Salesforce, was essentially that, right? They were building off you know, uh, Hadoop, they were leveraging cloud software, running on a scale-out hardware, and they were processing all the data and redefining CRM, right? Um, they were re-looking at how people interface with their relationships and their contacts and how to build a network, and it was all data-driven. It wasn't built on the legacy stack, it was built on the new stack, and the way that I've always thought about it is, look at what's happened in the consumer world. From web 1.0 to web 2.0, whatever version of the web we're on now, the Facebooks, the Twitters, all these guys have built their applications to be data-driven from day one, whether it's the feed, people you may know. That experience is making the user get more value out of these applications. If you look at the enterprise apps, they don't do that. No one likes their enterprise applications. No one gets any value out of their enterprise applications. And I think that's starting to change because they're using the same stack, the same technology underpinnings that the consumer guys, frankly, invented because they had no choice, are now being used in the enterprise. So I think a lot of these you know, new, related to Q is just one example. We're seeing a lot of other people that are using these new technologies to build very So why, why did they sell? I mean, would they sell because they were uh, a feature of someone else's or the global expansion? I mean, this is a question we were talking about on theCUBE today yeah. is there's M&A opportunity, which is not necessarily a bad thing, an exit's an exit. If, if you can make it globally, then you can be that billion dollar company. If yeah. you can't, then you might be acquired. So that's a reality that people are facing. Um, is there a reason why they got acquired because it was a better fit for uh, someone to fill their portfolio? Um, is that a trend that you see to see more of? Look, I think a lot of the uh, incumbent companies are going to have to do M&A in order to kind of stay ahead of this, this change. And I, and I don't, I don't, 
fault them. I mean, if you look at what's happened, these, some of these trends have happened so quickly. Like, you know, five years ago, maybe two companies in our portfolio was on, built on AWS. Today, 99% of them are. I mean, the, and mobile, like how many people had iPhones five years? And like, these things have happened so quick that I don't expect, uh, you know, the, the, the incumbents to be able to react well, to some the of these buyers changes. out there, like, like, the, right. like the IBMs and the VMwares, they're buyers for the startups. You they, guys, they're, they're, I mean, they're, so they're, they're looking for innovation and, you know, Frank and I were lamenting earlier, we, we, we hope not all our companies sell because, you know, I think we think some of them have a lot of legs to, to build really interesting things. Frank, the consolidation is not necessarily a bad sign. There's more waves coming and the market's shifting. Consolidation can be a good thing, right? I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, do you agree that it's not necessarily a bad thing if Jeff Kelly's research is, is somewhat accurate? Yeah, so uh, just in terms, of, in terms of consolidation, when, when a, tech, when a uh, class of technology becomes m more mature, buyers get comfortable when they can actually buy something from a company of size, right? So typically, uh, what we've seen in the last few years or the last 10 years is that large buyers of technology, again, uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise uh, IT organizations, are willing to try things from smaller organizations, but for them to make then a big bet, they like to go with a leader. And so consolidation will usually produce a leader. And so it is, it is definitely a good thing, as long as you're invested in, one, as long as you're invested in the leader. Well, cloud also requires speed to market. So I've heard some from the big buyers of the startups saying, hey, if they, if they can't go global, they're in a bridge to that. So it can be a win-win in that case. Do you see that happening amongst the big, big companies like the IBMs of the world? So uh, what you, is, is the question in terms of... Uh, I'm a startup and I'm like, okay, yeah. I got some venture funding. I either got to get sales yeah. quickly yeah. Or, or look for a buyer or is, this, is the, this is the classic probably board meeting you, yeah. you guys so, go at, walk yeah, so, into. So, so, so to be clear, right? Well, yeah. what we, like, Ping and I don't get paid for, you know, for, selling, uh, for getting a company started, putting one round of investment in and making, making a small amount of money for our investors. Uh, that's, not, that's not what we do. When we, when we make an investment, we are every investment we make, we're, we're thinking that it can be a, uh, a global standalone company. We don't make an investment and say, oh, this would be a great thing to sell to XYZ buyer for 50 million bucks. That's not, yeah. that's not what we do for a living. Uh, there'll be a consolidation of venture firms very quickly if, if, that, was, if that was the norm. Um, you know, that, being, that being said, at, at some point in a company's life, the management team together with the investors do make a decision and say, hey, what is it going to take for this company to be a durable standalone entity? And there's a bunch of variables that go into making, making that decision. What kind of company is it? How much capital is it going to take? Uh, can it get there in a meaningful amount of time before maybe a larger company wants to come and do the, do the same sort of thing? But by and large, if, if, the, if there's a large enough uh, total available market and, you have one, and you're part of one or two first movers uh, for a hot technology where customers are willing to pay uh, and get behind you, then you can usually attract enough capital to keep going and get to be that company, at least to have the perception of be a, a global company. And it does take a while. I mean, look at companies that are really now just, bar just barely global companies, even like Citrix Systems, a place that I worked. Uh, even today, like most of its revenue is still, is, they're probably still overweight, right, in, in U.S. versus the versus rest of the world, probably at, at least, I would say, two-thirds, as opposed to if you translate that to a Microsoft, which is only 28% U.S. Okay, so I got some questions from the, the Twitter sphere. So uh, um, a couple of them coming in. How well have you guys done backing startups that build tools, not apps? Um, or it, can you comment on that tool thing? And I'll like throw in my little two cents on there. Do you have to have a platform, or can you just stand alone with an app or a tool or a platform kind of an inherent you know, substrate within the app yeah. framework? Yeah. How well do you I mean, I have so, yeah, so, um, so in terms of uh, just, you know, just hard examples in, in, our, in, in the Ignition portfolio, one of our, one of our uh, top companies is actually a tools company. It's called Xamarin. It starts with the letter X. A uh, great couple of guys uh, building a uh, mobile application uh, development platform. Uh, and it'll be actually more than that. It'll do some more things at the runtime and, uh, and what have you. But it, it is something which is, uh, which is sold largely to uh, enterprise IT folks that are building enterprise mobile uh, applications. And so that's an example of a tools company that we like. Um, we, were, uh, we, have, we have not had success with anything that's sold, let's just say, software development frameworks or tools to other software, other professional software developers. Because those are the last folks that like to pay. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think the reality is even the tools companies that do become widely adopted end up becoming platform companies over time. So if it just stays as a tool company and is, it doesn't get broader in terms of the surface area, the problems it solves, then it's probably hard. So you bring up a good point. That's not a bad thing. You can come yeah. in and enter the market on a narrow yeah. scene with a tool and then sequence to a platform position. No, you know, a lot of times uh, some of our best companies have started off as tools and people are like, hey, you know, let's just use this thing. What is this thing? And next thing you know, 
you know, becomes widely adopted. I've always said so. if you say you're a platform, you got a target on your back from the day one. So it's hard way, to sell a platform. No one knows what to do with a platform. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, especially if it's a new category. Awesome. So a fun question came in. Um, when do you see artificial intelligence uh, hitting uh, the scene, obviously with wearables, Internet of Things? Um, how far away from full artificial intelligence, if you can even define what artificial intelligence is? So I'm sure you get a lot of guys coming in and talking about the, the, the big idea. So you seeing AI uh, hit the radar? Uh, we do see. Well, I mean, we, yeah. do, we we do see it. I yeah, we, we definitely see it. It's, it's unclear. <laughs> what see the, the ideas or not? <laughs> well, it's it's you know it's all depends on what what you consider AI. But you know, obviously, in the gaming world and yeah. you know, Anki, you know, that the iPhone card. I mean, there's there's a lot of different applications. Um, you know, what are the horizontal scale ones? You know, it's still a little early. So, the next question is, what project will be the next spark? No pun intended. In the Hadoop area, what spark? What's the what's the next kind of big wave or idea you're seeing that's enabling either creativity, innovation, investment, uh, outside of, say, Spark? Hmm. So if you, an open source project or just, just or in just general, a, where you're funding, of, you see opportunities uh, to throw dollars at where wealth can be created? Yeah, I think, well, I mean, it's like, it's, it's just, that's a, really, that's a really broad question. I think it goes back to some of the things that, that Ping was saying earlier about, around applications, and so, uh, I'm not saying that it's it, that the the investment area is over for uh, for infrastructure, but if I had if I had to look at two like equally exciting things, and one was infrastructure, and one was an application that made like all of our lives as professionals easier, I'd tell you which one I'm investing in. The yeah. one that's yeah the, the app yeah. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. Come on, we're like yes, go. Get, what, what is no, it? What's I, the name of the company again? Yeah. No, I agree. I I, I think uh, I think it's 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 awesome to see all these innovation at the infrastructure platform layer, and I think some of them will pierce through. But you know, when I talk to CIOs, um, they're just digesting what's currently there right now, and getting value out of that is, is, is enough of a challenge today, um, and finding the use cases and the workflows to really leverage those platforms. So I think the more applications, as, as Frank says, it helps the digestion of the existing stuff would be, you know, I think the first order. And then I think, then, then there's, and that always, you know, new applications break, you know, the platform, then there's new innovation there. Then you, so this thing will just keep I had going. a CIO said to me one time, he said, if I see them, someone walks in and sells me another platform, I'm going to shoot myself. So yeah. there's yeah. a lot of digestive pain from the yeah. million dollar, $10 million platform, rolling it out. They want more like Amazon. They want to stand up something quick. So you see yeah. that same thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's getting increased. I mean, the, the thing that, that, that this all comes back to is agility and velocity of, of development. If you look at how people are building applications today, it's a very different world than it was mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago, okay, right? Okay, so I got to put you guys on the spot for a fun question. Cal or Stanford in terms of innovation in Silicon Valley? <laughs> Computer science departments, which ones are you seeing the most action come from? Oh, Let's see if they answer this one. It's a tough yeah. one. Is it? Actually, you know, it really depends on, on what. Both are doing really interesting yeah. things. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, like, if you look at the AMP lab at Berkeley, it's been you know phenomenal in terms of the innovation. Yeah, the output has been really great uh, out of Berkeley for sure. I, I still like. Uh, I'll, I'll take an alternate. Pro I, I think. Uh, I think Washington, because you're from no, Seattle. I think. No, I'll say um, uh, Cambridge University in the UK. Yeah. If you want to go, want to go have a go have a trip and check out that computer lab, that's a lot of innovation there. So as that well. brings up the fun questions. Is computer science obviously changing from mission. You see how language. I ducked that? Yeah, I made, yeah, I made it. Good question. Yeah, neither yeah. or. Neither. He can't win I with that when you're VC. Everything's yeah. great. All computer yeah. science is great. Um, yeah. What disciplines are you seeing in, in in terms of right now? I'll say computer science has been the rage. These engineering degrees. Are you seeing cross disciplinary? We had I'll see machine learning brings up math, computer science. Is there uh, new faces, new disciplines yeah. you're seeing walk in the door? Design. I think design is probably one of the most needed talent right now in building killer applications. Uh, I, I think that's, yeah. if I look across our portfolio, people need more data guys, they need more design folks. And design isn't, has, has evolved much beyond, um, you know, colors. And, yeah. and Two fields and a button. Logos. Yeah, this is now how to create an experience. They're part programmers, um, they're part artists, they're part creative, uh, and so I think it's, it's a really difficult, um, you know, skill set okay, we're going to get some questions from the crowd, so we have the microphone running around. But I'll, before we go there, my final question is: um, 
the big data, cloud, you can stand up a startup pretty easily. Open source has been a great thing. We're seeing amazing you know, first class citizens with, with, with open source in the enterprise now. It's awesome for entrepreneurs. So what size checks is a Series A? What are you guys writing checks? I mean, Excel, you guys are a huge firm. I mean, entrepreneur comes in and says, hey, I only need a million five. Is that too small? I'll call, call me when you need 20 million. Obviously, you know, Andreessen Horowitz throws a lot of mm -hmm. cash around. What is the round size? Is there the pattern out there? Do you need to see something? I'm obviously going, oh, of course you're going to do early stage. But like, as a Series A, what, what's the average size that you guys are put into work? Because your time is limited, right, you guys? So, so what's going on in the VC world? And then we'll open it up to some questions. Size of checks, your time, feeder networks. What's some of the landscape uh, things right. going on in VC? I think I think it's better probably to look at just a broader set of data than what coming from from two just from just from two firms, and I think you know the median data shows that uh, you know that's Series A. I know this is kind of a wide range, you know tip you know four four million uh, for like a more like typical you know towards uh, you know towards eight to ten uh, if it's you know toward toward you know towards the higher end of that. And but how I think how uh, at least how we try to look at it, we don't look at it so much at the check size. Uh, for us, of course, it's you know, we're motivated by greed to some degree, we want to own as much of the company as we can, uh, but also we look at what it's going to take for the company to get to its next milestone. And for every and that next milestone will logically be a Series B. So for every company, it's going to be a little bit different. If it's maybe something where it's, you know, some folks that have a unique algorithm around doing, some, around, around doing something, maybe it's only going to be a handful of people, you know, working for 12 months, that's going to consume a lot less cash than, you know, than something that's going to be a big, a big infrastructure play. So the answer is, it really depends on, it depends on the company. Yeah, I mean, I always say the business drives the funding. The funding doesn't drive the business. So, I mean, last year I did a $2 million Series A and I also did a $15 million Series A. So it, there's really no, yeah. two very different businesses though, right? So yeah. um, they have different requirements. Yeah, but, but, there, but there's a lot of, pub, there is a lot of fun data that you can go after, that you can go after and you can get the median and average, uh, average numbers. It'll give you some. Well, you notice we didn't, I didn't ask any questions on the bubble. I know you got to run. So we, you know, I, I personally think it's very bubblicious, but, but the waves are coming. We're seeing it all through the industry. So, you know, yeah, as long as the waves are coming, it's great. Any questions from the crowd? We got a microphone uh, for the, uh, for the guys writing the checks, following the money. Oh, exactly. These guys there. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a comment on the bubble thing. So, had, I mean, in any given year since, since we had server computers, have we consumed less cores than the year before? Of course not. And as long as that trend continues, this is the industry to be in. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's a great growing market. Question from uh, the my crowd. My question is, uh, when will enterprise app marketplace take off? As you know, mobile app uh, marketplace has been there for many years. I'm talking about enterprise app on cloud. Enterprise apps on cloud, mobile's been around for years. When's that going to take off? Yeah, seems like you know. I'm not sure you you guys are familiar with the AWS uh, cloud marketplace, AWS marketplace. There are a lot of enterprise apps. Google is working on that. There are others like uh, that's for infrastructure service and uh, for Salesforce. They have SaaS marketplace. It's called a App Exchange, right? Things like that. I mean, I think it depends on. Yeah what categories, but a lot of them are taking off, right? Um, Slack in the messaging space is, is an example of enterprise app that's, that, that's exploding, so. Um, Amazon's had great success with their marketplace. People can download apps and they get low cost of sales. I mean, it's fantastic, right? And there's been a, you know, a slew of marketing apps on top of force.com that have done, done very well. So, you know, I think, you know, and, and I, don't, I don't think the mobile app and enterprise app ecosystem are, are different, I think. Right now, every app that we look at on the enterprise side is mobile first, out the gate. So I think those two worlds are, are converging as well. Yeah, and, and largely for for in-house written enterprise applications, there have been there, there are certain challenges related to access to data securely. And but but largely, what you if you look at some of the way that the networking infrastructure is being enhanced uh, in the uh, in the public clouds, that uh, that a lot of those those challenges will let's just say become diminished over the course of the next year or two. have an A that was sufficient to get you to the milestones for a B. Uh, traditional B milestones are repeatable sales model and, and revenue growth. Um, any more color on what, where you have to get to to qualify for a B? Uh, I, so I, since, since I answered answer the question earlier, so for me, um, uh, when I think about, again, depending on the size of the A, now sometimes if it's a super size series A, you may even want to get beyond that. But in, but in general, uh, you know, what, the way I think about a Series B is getting to product market fit, and there has to be some sort of metrics around that. 
So I mean, this not, may, may or may not be a, rev, uh, a revenue number. I think we have time for one more question because I know Frank's got to catch a plane. Appreciate your time yeah, sure. coming on. But uh, any, one more question? Over there? Oh, to the right? All right. Uh, hi, thanks for your time, guys. So uh, just a question about companies which go IPO and companies which try to remain private. So I, for an, I mean, they are an extreme end, like Hortonworks, which went public like with really res, less market cap. But if you look like Pure Storage or some other companies, they have Nutanix. They have like a huge market cap, and they're still private. So what is the thesis or their thoughts behind it? I mean, thesis behind going public. <laughs> Well, as fast as possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some companies try to go as fast as possible. Some are trying to be. That's private. a good question. What do you guys think? I mean, are they jumping the gun early? Is it a window issue? Is it? Do they jump? You know, what, well, I'm new to the business. I haven't been involved in an IPO yet. But uh, well, I mean, the reason they go thing. public yeah. is yeah. because you need to raise money, um, and you have no yeah. other. You know, that's that that that's why companies. Big reason why they go public is they need to raise money, right? So. You know, and the VCs can get liquid too, but not all. They don't always sell. On, yeah, on the IPOs, you know, a lot right? of times, you know, you're locked up, et cetera. So, I, so I think that that's the primary motivator to go public, right? Um, and then, you know, if you can raise capital as a private company, you know, then then that's the question of, you know, do you go public or do you go private? And a lot has to do with kind of uh, what the company wants to achieve. If you stuff, raised, right? you know, three hundred million dollars in a private round, that's like the old days yeah. of going public. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the, re like, the reality is, yeah. you know, going public has certain constraints uh, to the business, right? You Michael Delta is coming private because he didn't want to deal with right. the So you I think right. a lot of yeah. companies, I feel like they still have a lot of innovation. Yeah. There's things they want to do without the constraints of being public, you know, we'll stay private for a bit longer. Well, the hassles like in, um, in, in reporting and attention, well, right? I mean, yeah. is that well, I mean, legit? Like, is that, well, is that legit? Operate, yeah, again, yeah. Yeah, a, public, a public, there's like, we mind what we're saying is when people say going public, the, actually, the actual, the, the way to really think about it is operating, operating as a public entity is what it really means. And that means that there's, you know, there's like you're saying, there's level, levels of disclosure. There's some benefits of that. Some folks feel that uh, a company that is operating publicly by definition is more transparent and can be more trusted, but that really is, is meaningless since most of the larger private companies effectively operate as public entities, as public entities from an internal, uh, internal governance perspective. So I think when people say, well, it's just a hassle to be public, once you get big enough, you're really operating that way, uh, yep. operating that yep. way anyway. But anyway, it's just, this is just another pool of capital. And it's- and, and You still have the certain hurdles to go public though. You yeah, can't just go public. Yeah. Or, I, I, I think the, be surprised. The, the point Frank made that I want to emphasize, going public is very different than being successful as a public company. Um, and I think time will tell which companies are actually going to be successful as a public company, which means you need to have a, a real business model, you need to be predictable, it needs to be durable, and, and all that stuff. Um, Uber so, just added another billion to their private round so, today. So I think a lot, of a, lot of companies stay, a lot of companies stay private uh, because they want to make sure they have all those pieces together so when they go public, they can be successful for many years to come and continue to grow. Uh, so I always say, like, you know, don't look at the date the company goes public. You know, look at them in two, three years from now and see how they did. Yeah. Guys, thanks for your time. Frank, right, I know you've got to catch a plane, but I'd like to give us a final word. What's the outlook? Just share with the folks watching and also here in the room. Uh, and the big data industry is changing. Obviously, you can add in mobile apps and, and other fabric kind of stuff within the, in the big data world. I said operating system mindset. You're, what's your final walk away uh, guidance, advice? In terms of you're looking writing checks, you're evaluating the landscape. What's your your guidance for this industry? Yeah, and so you know, every day I you know, I I look at the, look at myself at the end of uh, end of every day and ask myself what I've learned, and if I've learned something new, and that makes it a that makes it a good day. And I can just tell you, it's for the last, you know, I guess I, I first met the folks at Cloudera. I guess it was maybe in in uh, in 2000, probably in 2008, uh, 2008 time frame. And you know, it really opened my eyes you know, to, you know, to a set of things that I just thought were not, were not possible from, from an application perspective. And just my, my parting thought is that you know, don't accept, you can't accept the status quo. You have to think bigger, and it's these big ideas that were just not possible because of things like cost, because of, uh, because of size, because of speed. So we don't, we don't have to accept the limits anymore. And, uh, or at least in the, in the current time frame, and also some of the things that Ping was talking about in terms of what the folks at, uh, folks at Intel or other microprocessor folks do around in terms of Moore's Law. We're in a, we have an opportunity right now to think bigger than we've ever thought before. It's not just about operational savings. And that's, that's unfortunately the world that enterprise IT lived you know, for so long. We're in that replatforming now. So you know, I think it's just uh, the most exciting time to be in enterprise IT uh, in a long time. Ping, your final thoughts and guidance and learnings and, and advice? 
You know, I, I think, uh, just to add it, Frank, I think it's, it's an unbelievable time, as you said earlier, to be an entrepreneur uh, in, in the enterprise software IT space. So, you know, I think the only thing I would add is uh, it's the team is so important. Um, so if you're starting something or you're joining something, I don't think you can overemphasize that dimension because, you know, every good idea will have lots of people doing it. And it's the team that has those instincts and the subtle ability to see around the corners, two steps ahead, et cetera, et cetera, are the ones that are going to build, build the great opportunities. So, you know, that's one thing that, you know, we constantly obsess about is, you know, finding those entrepreneurs and that can build those teams and those teams that can build those great companies. Guys, thanks for your time. Yeah, I know you're you. really busy. Give everyone a round of applause here for the venture capitalist, Bing Lee, Frank Gartali. Okay. Now we're going to adjourn to the party room next door. Thanks for your time. I know we went a little bit over. I appreciate uh, your time, and, and thanks for everyone for coming for SiliconANGLE, the Cube, Wikibon. Uh,